few years ago, I made a film called Crayon Dragon back in 2012. And the reason why I'm bringing this up now is because it's very related to this video tutorial. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a shot from that film and give it an updated look. And the reason why I wanted to redo this shot is because I was never really happy with how the film turned out in the end. So I wanted to see if I could give myself salvation for that. The shot I'll be redoing is the shot where the girl, Rian, discovers what she can do in that painted world. She gets excited when she sees her work come to life. So we're gonna give this a makeover and see how far we can push the shot even more. So there you have it guys, this is the remake of that same shot. Here we have that same similar lineless style uh, for the girl, along with some new lighting techniques over here. We still have that lantern effect going on, uh, I also added some new effects animation. I decided to go with a new direction in terms of color and lighting, so overall it just feels a bit more dramatic and I'm definitely going to talk about why I did these choices. So the softwares I'm going to use are the same ones I used years ago, which is Flash, After Effects, and Photoshop. I'll buy Adobe, because everyone just loves Adobe. And the version I have is CS6. Um, as you can see, we're going to be doing the girl in Flash, both the animation and the coloring. In the background, you can see lanterns and effects. We're also going to be doing that in Flash. Um, the background will be done in Photoshop. I'm also going to talk about how I used stock footage to add to the atmosphere. The final stage will be compositing and After Effects. Uh, we usually call this stage uh, polishing the poo-poo, so, so yeah, I hope you're all excited to start. So here are my thumbnails. Um, I just want to show you guys that every time I start a shot, I always usually thumbnail it before I actually start animating. You know, just explore different ideas on how she should act and how she should, you know, react to things. Um, her performance. As you can see, I draw really crudely for thumbnailing, just like, you know, little lollipop heads with uh, stupid expressions, and that's because I just want to get the idea and the performance down, and I'll just focus on uh, detailed things later when I'm animating it. So I know I wanted her to be surprised, and later on she just gets really excited. And I was exploring, you know, different ways I can draw that. Um, how do I, how do I show those expressions? And there's so many ways you can show excitement. And there's so many ways you can show amusement. Um, I don't really write things, but sometimes I do. Uh, for this case, I think it's good that I do, so I can show you guys what goes behind my head. Um, here you can see I've been trying to see like whether her head should be tilted um you know how she should look when she takes another breath before each key pose um in just different ways on how she could show a certain emotion like excitement should she laugh should she have her hands up um or should she should she have this um this face here anyways yeah so this these are this is the initial idea process um all right so now that i know what i want we can start we can start posing out the keys. So the thing about this project is it's actually going to be shot in CinemaScope, but because this is just a shot of a bust of a character, I'm just going to go for the HD standard here. Well, 16 by 9 aspect ratio just to work on for the girl, and I can just resize her and stuff. Okay, so let's get started. So yeah, again, I'm going to use about the 16 by 9 aspect ratio, but instead of using 1920 by 1080, which is the standard, um, I like to work bigger so that I have more room to to zoom in and zoom out. So I'm just going to shoot it up by 2500 by 1406 pixels. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter to me what the number is, just as long as it's 16 by 9. And I'm not really going to use all of it, so. It's just there as my drawing space for the girl's animation and otherwise. Um, so yeah, so this is what Flash looks like. Um, as you can see, I am going to use just the brush tool. I'm not going to be really specific on how to use Flash. I can make another video on that. But I'll talk about certain actions I do in Flash so you guys get a basic idea on what my thoughts process is. 
So, let's get started in the actual drawing. So, I usually start when it comes to like close up of faces, I usually start with the cranium and then work my way through, you know, the cheeks, the jaw, um, and then just gesture the neck, and then, you know, just add ears just so it can help me align the eyes later. Um, as you can see, I'm being really, really uh, loose, so I just focus on getting the expression down. Um, I will add little details like hair, um, have you know cross-section lines so I can add the eyes and the nose and the nose I'm just you know you just using a symbol like oval or circle just an indicator or placeholder for later but yeah I'm just drawing really loose at this point just to get the idea down because I can always go back and fix it up add some more details on it later as I thumbnailed earlier I'm not going for something highly exaggerated, something very subtle, so I'm trying to keep the expression sort of subtle and not too broad at this point. Um, and I, I'm thinking slowly here, oh yeah, this is sort of a low angle shot, but it's only really slight, so yeah. So it might change the way on how I line the eyes. So this is my first drawing, it's the first storytelling key I have, so I'm just gonna put a 1 and a star. You don't have to do this, but I usually do this because it helps me keep track on what are my most important keys, what are the storytelling keys that I can refer back to later. Okay, so now I'm gonna work on the next uh, storytelling pose. In Flash, if you just press F7, you can immediately create a new blank keyframe. So now I'm going to start thinking about the next golden pose, which is, to me, it's the last storytelling key. So I'm probably going to just jump ahead to drawing ahead, drawing the last pose. So I'm thinking of things like contrast, or what is the end result of the shot, or how does, ex how does their expression change. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start drawing that, and you know, I'm thinking... At this point, she's gonna have a big smile on her face. Like like I thumbnailed earlier, it's gonna be more like she's amused and excited. So um, that's what I want to show in contrast to her her subtle surprise in the first golden pose. So yeah, so I'm gonna draw a smile first. Um, definitely a contrast to you know that lame normal face that she usually has. Um, her eyes are going to probably be a bit more flatter because it's going to be pressed by her cheeks. I'm going to talk about the cheeks soon. And yeah, see ya. so yeah, I'm just going to like keep adjusting. I'm always adjusting stuff, so that's, that's definitely something you'll see a lot in these videos. I'm going to go back and forth. Oh, and you'll notice that I'm flipping back and forth from my previous key to the current key. Um, I'm basically trying to replicate the feeling of flipping my drawings like I would do in traditional animation. So instead of just using the onion onion skinning tool, um, I'm actually flipping my drawings back and forth. And the way I'm doing this is I'm pressing the, the comma key and the period key on my keyboard. Anyways, back to the smiles. Um, yeah, so the idea I want to show is you know, when she smiles, her, her cheeks, you know, elevate, while when her, when her when her lips are more puckered, it's... her cheeks get more narrow. So that's basically my thoughts process in terms of showing the contrast in this character, basically. So, yeah, here's... It, here's a basically a, a rough version of my key. Um, you know, yeah, again, constantly just making, a, making changes. I notice, you know, I'm adding notes to myself, like, maybe the shoulder should really, really be up. And now I'm gonna just, like, I'm just gonna add, like, a star and a two, just to, just to remind myself that this is the next golden pose. I'm gonna go back and adjust and make sure the volumes sort of match. I can always do this thing later, but just to make sure the performance stays consistent, um, it's good to think about the volume early on. So now I'm going to make 
the the next key, the next golden key, which is actually in between what happens between one and two. The way I'm gonna add a drawing in between these two keys is I go back to the first drawing, well the first key, and then I press F5. This extends the frame. It doesn't make a new key, it just extends it. And then once I have that extended, I press F7. F7 converts whatever my marker is on into a blank key. As I said earlier, F7 either creates a new blank key or converts an existing frame to a blank keyframe. Um, yeah, actually I'm just gonna flip back and forth between the next and the previous key using, yes, the, uh, the period and the coma key. Um, you know, honestly I could do this using the onion skin, but the problem I have with just using the onion skin alone is I tend to lose volume in my drawings because I'm basically tracing in between the lines and not really thinking about the form. Um, this is something my first year animation teacher ad addressed. Um, there was one time he gave us like uh, an exercise and you know he, he was saying that he didn't want to see us use the light table because the light table it it can be a bad habit because at this point you're not really thinking about the form, you're just drawing in between the lines when you're using the light underneath your animation table and urged us to flip more. And it helps a lot because when you flip it you actually see how, how the shape changes, what are some of the important accents, and when when or how an object is supposed to turn in three-dimensional space. I don't think the onion skinning tool is bad at all, and honestly, if you like to use it, go go ahead, but if you want to learn how to in-between and understand form, it's good to constantly flip back and forth. Um, because, again, it helps you see how how the shapes in the form relate to each other from one drawing to the next. So yeah, I'm just figuring out how I can transition the mouth shape. That's always the hardest bit because, um, I mean, the easiest bit is showing from a frown to a smiley face, but um, the transition in between that, it's always a tricky bit because one, you're thinking about how the mouth shape works technically, and two, is it right for the emotion? For this point, for what I have, I'm trying to show amusement. I'm trying to show a bit of like, um, like she's she's surprised, she's sort of excited, but it's it's still underplayed. It's like she's still gathering all that, all her thoughts. Anyways, that's my next golden pose. I decided to go back and refine the drawings a bit more have a bit more detail, um, have some information that was missing. You'll notice that I renumbered some of my drawings so it's easier for me to organize. They're much more in order and it's also easier for you guys to keep track on what I'm doing. Before I get into breakdowns, I realized I forgot another storytelling key. Well, honestly, this could just pass as another breakdown but to me, it'll help me organize things easier for me because I tend to work breakdowns as sort of how I in between things. So the pose I want to have is in between two and three, which is I want her to dip her head before she smiles. This is so that this accent emphasizes the last pose. Instead of her just simply slowly smiling, it would be nice just to have that quick contrast, that quick change where, where her whole body attitude just becomes more alert at the last second. It'll give that last pose more attention. This is actually really tricky for me because instead of the girl just transitioning into the, the pose where she smiles, um, I have to, I'm, I'm having her dip down and that itself is a challenge because not only are you trying to emphasize the acting, but you're also trying to maintain some of the volume, some of the shapes, uh, just making sure it stays consistent. And, you know, that's always, it's always a mind boggle for me at least. Part of the challenge is while she is dipping, her face is actually in the transition from her last pose to the next. 
So if you think about it, she's dipping, but the face itself is just transitioning into the smile. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing to think about. But making this a main pose will make it so much easier for me when I break it down. That's the advantage I admire on CG animation or digital animation in any form because, you know, you could just animate the face and then slap it on the body and tweak it so it matches. And it could work really well. Once I finish and label this as a golden pose, then we can move on to the breakdown phase. To me, a breakdown is more of a extreme that helps transition from one storytelling pose to the next. It's not an in-between where you simply just in-between the drawings from A to B. It's a key. It's another key that emphasizes the performance or how that character is supposed to get from that pose to another. You know, a character can dip their head or move their body first. They could step in while their torso moves in later, or their head would just guide them to the next location. It's a key drawing that supports the storytelling keys. As you can see here, I'm trying to figure out how I can break down from my first drawing to the next key drawing. Um, I could make her torso and her shoulders move up first before her head. So I'm indicating that she's taking in air. This is to show that I'm emphasizing her gasp first, and then it'll follow up with her expression. You can see I'm sort of adding these mini timing charts for each part of the body. For the body, I'm saying that it's favoriting the next frame, and for the head, I'm saying it favorites the previous frame. So as you can see, I'm actually drawing the head closer to the previous frame while the body it's closest to the last frame. Therefore, it's making the least dramatic move compared to the body. This is a concept called spacing, where I consider how far or how close certain parts of the body should move in order to strengthen the acting. There's a lot to talk about the breakdown phase when it comes to rough animating. It's the phase I enjoy the most because you're basically linking all the problems together and solving it with those links. And there's so many ways you can link them, it's just what type of link you choose and how it serves as your overall performance. Um, yeah, to me, I'm definitely going to make another video just talking about breakdown and how you can use it to emphasize your performance. In fact, when I'm given a lot of scenes in storyboarding where I basically have to animate things, I usually just leave it as a breakdown phase because it just has all the information I'll need for that specific shot and scene. Now for this breakdown, she's blowing out air. I could approach it the same way I did in the first breakdown in where I have the body move first, but instead I think I don't want to prioritize an aspect or just a part of a body, so I'm just gonna treat both the head and the torso and the shoulders the same way, as in same timing, same spacing, uh, nothing too different. With that being said, I think I'm still gonna try and favor the first frame for both of them because I'm still emphasizing that she's gasping or she, she still blowing out air but really slowly. It's a timing thing. You'll start to feel it once you animate a lot. It's also a performance thing. You'll also notice how fast or how slow um, certain body parts move when you act them out. That's why a lot of animators tend to act things out to get that timing and that performance down. I feel like I'm repeating myself. <laughs> Now the next breakdown is a little different because it's not simply based on the idea that she's breathing in and breathing out. Now I want to add an accent or a little thing that she'll do right before she stops at that huge smile face. The great thing about doing breakdowns is that you can also indicate little accents that can add flavor and texture to the acting. So. For this bit, I want her to maybe twist or jerk her head just a tiny bit, so it just makes the transition a bit more interesting. And because it's a bit more interesting and a tiny bit different, 
people will notice it and therefore it'll lead the attention to her face again because the jerk is just so sudden that people will notice it. That's the impact I want when I end the shot. So because this breakdown has a few turns and a few arcs, um, I decided that maybe we could add a tiny bit more secondary breakdowns for these breakdowns um, just to set up my guide for where the nose, the mouth, or where the arcs move in corresponding to the turns. If you guys just heard that weird noise, that was my dog. Um, she's just roaming around the house looking for something to do. And when she's bored, she barks. Anyways, yeah. I'm making secondary breakdowns for the breakdown, so when I do in between it, I'll have a proper guide. It doesn't really matter on how many breakdowns you'll need, um, it's all up to you really. For me, I tend to have a lot of breakdowns just so that it helps me in terms of where and how things should move. All right. Now we're ready to time things out. Um, as you can see, I did go back and, you know, fix some of the breakdowns I have, uh, just, just revisiting them. I also took out all my labels for the golden poses and things like that because now we're actually going to label the timing for, for the animation, which means I'm going to actually have to label them with numbers of actual frames. So when I time out 2D animation on the computer, I kind of just space them equally so I get an idea on, you know, how long each frame could read for or um, what's needed. I mean, if you just play it alone, you know, it works, it moves, but honestly, I don't think the timing works. It's because the whole timing is too even. You know how there's an argument where asymmetrical things are more interesting to look at? Well, the same thing goes with timing. Um, when things are too even, things get too constant, too, too predictable, and just not interesting. But when you add a lot of variety in the timing, it makes it more engaging to watch because there's a lot more interesting things and more interesting beats you can count to. That's why in cinematic film scores, there's suspense, there's a calm moment, there's a climax, etc. Thanks to the instant playback we can do on a computer, I can just easily time my stuff over here and preview it. So using the F5, I'm actually adjusting the timing for each drawing, making some drawings last longer than the others. When dealing with timing, you kind of want to think about the overall rhythm, and you want to keep that rhythm diverse there are slow parts, there are fast parts, and it's up to you on how you want to utilize them. The shot only lasts for 48 to 50 frames, that's around 2 seconds, and I have to use that timeline wisely to utilize interesting timing with this girl. So I'm thinking about her performance. When she exhales, it, it slows down, so that could affect the timing too on how long I want the keys to last for. In my heart, I know I want the parts where she's breathing to be slow and gentle, and maybe when she smiles, she's more active, and a lot of those bits can happen much faster. To me, this sort of builds this kind of anticipation that we're expecting from the girl, where she's all she's taking it in, and then all of a sudden she just rolls with it. She's excited, she's full of energy. And I kind of want to show that in the two seconds we have, which sucks. So as you can see, I've been test running some of the timing adjustments that I've been doing. I already have a pretty clear idea on how I want the timing to be. I just wanted to show you guys that even with the same drawings, adjusting the timing can change so much and different approaches to that timing can alter a lot of things in your work. It'll affect the feeling. It'll probably emphasize or weaken a certain feeling. And that's the beauty of finding the rhythm in your timing. So you can just keep experimenting with it until you find the rhythm that works well, that works best for your shot. As you can see now, I'm being a bit more risky in terms of how short some of my storytelling keys last for. Um, some last for a very long time, while some just last for just for two frames. Um, and, you know, if you play it all together, 
it kind of creates a very diverse rhythm. Once I have the timing down, I'm going to label all my frames and keys. Now I'm writing the frame number on the upper right. This is so that I can add timing charts underneath. I'm actually matching the number of the frame in where the frame is according to the timeline. This is so that just in case I have to in between a drawing and I have to shift my drawings around, I'll always remember where I can return them according to the number I put on the upper right. As you can see, I'm underlining and circling some keys. When I circle my keys, I'm basically telling myself that these are my storytelling keys, my important keys. When I underline a drawing though, this indicates that this is my breakdown, meaning this is the breakdown between my important keys. This is so that when I, in between a breakdown to an important key, I can just easily create a timing chart with just normal frames and just in between it from there. It's just easier for me to organize. According to Richard Williams, he's very minimal on where he circles his keys. I've heard of traditional animators who basically circle every key, saying that every key is important or something. I fall somewhere in between where I really do think about emphasizing the importance of a golden or storytelling pose. Um, but then so sometimes I would just turn a normal breakdown or a normal key into a key frame so it's easier for me to organize. A lot of animators work different ways. Um, it, it's all up to you on how you want to work because you know sometimes you're going to have to work with an in-betweener and you guys will have to basically settle on a workflow. Now I want to talk briefly about timing charts and in-betweening. I'm not going to utilize the chart just yet but I am going to talk about how I'm thinking about timing this. So take this timing chart as a point of reference. From drawing 1 to 9, I want to show that the action is starting to pick up speed. Therefore, more drawings needs, there, there needs to be more drawings favoring the first drawing. Because there's more frames before frame 7, which is just like 2 frames before frame 9, this means that the action is slowly starting to pick up by 7. By, by drawing 7, it means that the transition between 1 to 9 is midway. That's why 7 is marked on the middle of the time chart. I'm going to draw a timing chart differently so you can see it clearer. Basically the same thing. I mean, you can, you can draw a timing chart any way you want, but just to get my point clear, this, is, this means that the action is starting to pick up speed. The curvy lines I'm drawing on the side for each number means that I'm having... I'm like halving each key to another. That's why from 5 to 7, 5 to 1, 3 to 1, it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This means that the spacing between these keys are getting much more narrow. According to this chart, 3 to 1 seems like it'd be the most tightest of the spacing. But you can't get 3 without having 5 first, and you can't get 5 yet if you don't have 7. The next timing chart I'm going to make is basically almost the same thing, but it's reversed. This means that the action is slowing down. At this point, the girl is breathing air out. She's exhaling and she's nearly done, so she's slowing down and she's gonna stop. So instead of having frames closer to the previous one, it's actually closer to the next one. This means that there's more information and more frames favoring the last, the later frame. The way I'm timing it is very similar to how I timed the last chart, but it's just an opposite effect. By frame 11, it's already halfway between 9 to 19, and it just gets smaller from 13 to 15 to 17, etc. If you guys are interested, I'd be willing to make another video explaining the timing charts more because there's a lot to talk about them. It does begin to get crazy convoluted if you have so many keys and frames and drawings, um, and that's why sometimes I don't treat them as twos like I'm charting them here. I actually in between them as fours or eights because it gives me more space and more room to in between them. But if you want to maintain the timing that's close to the twos, you can't just chart them as halves. You have to probably chart them as thirds or maybe just purely favoring the previous or the last key. It's either you chart it that way or you make a breakdown that represents that and then your in-betweener could just in between straight on from your breakdowns to the next and so on. 
I'd have to explain it visually at some point. Anyways, with the timing set and a rough idea on how we'll end between this, I think we're ready to actually tie down the drawings. When all my rough animation is done, I go through this phase called the tie down. It's not exactly a cleanup, it's more about solidifying the drawings that you have. So now that my rough pass is done, I'm going to have to create a new layer where I can do the tie down. For me to do this though, I need to make my roughs a different color than what I have now. Double clicking on the layer name allows me to rename it. Now I need to change my roughs into a lighter color. For me to do this, I have to select the edit multiple frames button and drag the slider so all the frames are under it. Unlike the onion skinning tool, this allows me to edit all the frames at once. Using a selection tool, I drag and click and select all the frames and change it to a lighter color. I would then make a new layer and that could just be my tie down pass. Now because I'm really paying attention to being solid and uh, the details in the drawings, I'm going to work with a smaller brush and I'll zoom in more so I can be more intricate in those details. Since it's not exactly the cleanup stage, I'm just being sketchy and rough still, but a bit more intricate than I usually am. Um, at this point, I'm just figuring out the overall form and shape of the character, like the construction of the character and turning my shorthands into detailed factors. Since I'm no longer trying to find the essence of the performance, I'm just going to focus more on trying to finish the look of this character. I would add more detail to her hair, um, be more intricate in her eyelashes, and think about how her clothing works, her collar, and now I'm considering, hey, what if the scene had wind? Maybe I'll have to try and find a way to uh, show secondary motion through the hair later on. Once I'm done with that tie down, I go to the last keyframe of my rough because the last key is the last thing you'll see and I want it to stay consistent and similar to my first key. So I'm going to do that next because that drawing is actually my second golden pose. Again, it's that storytelling drawing. So that's something I need to figure out first before I do all the things in between my first drawing and the last drawing. I think it's time that I speed things up a bit. You'll start to notice a pattern that I'm working with, whereas I'm working in the same order that I did with the roughs. Basically, all the story keys that I did earlier, the first thing I did, I'm doing it in the same order in tie down fashion. So if I in between it later, I can be more consistent because I have all the important keys down first. Basically, I'm doing the same process as I am with the roughs, but now I'm just fine tuning the roughs I have, but I'm still drawing them in the same order. Honestly, I don't think I'm going to match with the charts I'm putting down here. It's just to give an idea on what kind of timing I want, since I'm actually going to in between uh, these tie downs in fours, and I'll show you what I mean soon. And then after I have the storytelling keys tied down, I would tie down the breakdowns. So the order would be the first initial storytelling keys, then if there are any secondary storytelling keys, I would do that. And then after that, I would tie down the breakdowns. And then if there were secondary breakdowns, I would then tie down that. Then after that, I would in between everything in fours. Since this isn't the final result, I'm not trying to have a lot of drawings because that I can save up for the cleanup section. I just need enough drawings that will help me for the final in betweening for the cleanup. So that's why I'm in-betweening in fours. And the thing about in-betweening in fours is that I can't just simply in-between it the way I in-between things in twos. For example, if I timed it where the shoulders move first, I'm gonna make it so that the shoulder is closest to the later drawing, while the head, like I planned on the twos, is much closer to the previous drawing. If I were doing this in twos, it would just be a simple in-between, but since I'm doing it on fours, I'm really, really trying to be specific in the spacing of my lines because for the final cleanup, it's going to be in twos and I want my fours to feel like they're close to how I'd animate on twos. It's kind of weird. I'd have to demonstrate it some other time and I'll have to show it with a proper time chart and talk about that in the time chart video. 
And remember when I mentioned about how I considered wind? Well, I'm trying to apply that with the hair, adding some subtle overlap with the hair. So here's the tie down in between in mostly fours and some twos. There are only a few twos because I felt that some of the drawings needed more information in their transition. Since I'm done with the rough animation, I decided to hide and remove it and see how it looks with tie down alone. So let's play this sucker and see how it turned out. It doesn't look too bad. There are lots of things I could fix and change, but as of now, I guess it's best to move forward. Well guys, this concludes the main animation part for the overall tutorial. The next part will be focusing on coloring the character, using the lineless style. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I wish I could have been more detailed in a lot of bits, but there's just a lot of things to talk about. But I'd love to address them sometime. If you guys have further questions or requests, please leave a comment below. Happy animating guys, and please support the streaming workshop.